Good day, folks. Uh, welcome to my shop, or welcome back to my shop, depending on if you've ever been here in the shop with me before on video. As some of you old timers might notice that this is not actually my old shop, this is my new shop. But uh, today's video is going to be a nice walk around, full build, walkthrough of my 21 Polaris General XP4 1000 in matte military tan or as we've started calling it, Lieutenant Tan. <laughs> if anybody can guess where that reference comes from, just uh, drop it in the comments. I'll give you a hint, shrimp boat. This is gonna be, like I said, a full build kind of walkthrough. I'll go over everything I've done to the machine in its current state. This is about the fourth upgrade I've done, and this is a pretty major one. And I think this is gonna be it. There's not really much else I can do to it other than just replace things for the sake of replacing it so uh, at this point i would i would basically call it done there may be some motor and or transmission upgrades later on down the road if needed but that's going to be about it so what i'm going to do is just like i said go through what's on it right now i'll just skip whatever it had before and uh start from the front work my way back kind of top down and then we'll go to the inside at the end. Just had a nice little rain shower. Uh, it's nice and cool in here. The wind's blowing just a little bit, so thought maybe I could get this done before the sun comes back out and bakes us all with its humidity or causes the humidity to, you know, you know what I mean, anyway. So right up front here, we have an Axon, a Warren Axon 5500 winch. I did elect to go for the synthetic rope, even though I don't trust them as much as I do the wire rope, but they are a whole lot easier to handle and they don't poke holes in your fingers. This winch is controlled by a switch on the dash or your cell phone, which is pretty neat. You can control it with a Warren cell phone app and you can run the line in and out. It will also show you the voltage, the temperature of the motor, and the load that the winch is uh, experiencing right there in the app. And uh, if any of those three conditions are outside of what it considers optimal, it will shut off and it will not pull again until you get the situation corrected. It can be a little bit of a pain uh, when that happens, but as an aside, or I guess as a direct result of that, it also doesn't burn itself out trying to over pull. So, it's, it's a good thing, as we, we've had experience in that department. Now the winch is mounted to this uh, HMF uh, winch bumper. Um, I believe it's HMF. It's the same guys that make the, the serious exhaust kits, but they also make uh, some other parts for UTVs, and they call it their equipment line, and that's what this is, an equipment HMF front winch bumper. I got a nice little tow hook right down here. That is obviously if I need to be pulled out. Um, you do not want to use your winch line as a tow rope. I've seen a lot of people do it. I've done it and I ended up tearing up my uh, worn uh, 4500 that came with the buggy. I actually damaged the bushings that the drum rolls in by using the, the rope as a tow rope. So that's, that's a bad thing. It's a no, no, don't do it. Another good thing for that little hook is when you run a winch, I mean a snatch block on your winch line, you can have a nice anchor point to tie back to. And then right below that, we got a 10 inch Pro Armor little light bar here. It is um, partnered with a longer roof mounted Pro Armor bar. I bought those uh, off the Polaris site when I ordered the machine. I actually had on my first round of upgrades, I had everything for this machine sitting in the shop waiting on it before I even found one. <laughs> it took me a couple of, several months actually to find one of these things. And I did finally find one in Crookston, Minnesota, and it was the only one in the country that was available that hadn't already been sold. So I drove from Georgia to Crookston, Minnesota to go pick this thing up. And uh, I needed it or I wanted it that bad because of the fire situation for my other one but anyway um moving back behind that just a little bit 
you can see right here we have a blinker kit i put that on because this summer georgia was going to do a registration for these vehicles but um they knew they were going to get swamped with them and they didn't even have the tags for them yet so they're trying to get everything together and right now they've got it dated for december uh, for registration so i'm just kind of getting prepped for that but also where we go ride in Tennessee, West Virginia, places like that up there, uh, we're in the road a lot and we're in traffic a lot and it's just kind of courteous to other vehicles to be able to indicate your intentions as you're approaching intersections and whatnot. So the next thing I'll show you is actually under the hood here. This is more of a convenient item, but it is really convenient and pretty cool if I do say so myself. And it's really made for a Jeep. Um, but this little compressor is made for side-by-sides. It's a tiny little thing, but it works really well. And then this little control box, it came from a Jeep kit. And the compressor puts air into the control box and then the air feeds through these uh, PEX lines that run through the vehicle and go to the wheel well um, and in the wheel well i've got these valve stems in all four corners and then in my dry box i got four pigtails and i attach it from the valve stem down to the valve stem on the wheel a little leftover sprinkle there anyway and when i hook all four of them up then they equalize all four tires it's another good way to pump up one of them if it took a smack or something and gets low or you have to plug it or patch it and you need to fill it up you can just fill it up off the other three and once they equalize then you can run your pump and pump them back up to wherever you wanted them and you can also let the air out right here as well now let me go ahead and demonstrate that for you right quick i've got the battery turned off that's another uh feature that i added uh, any of you that's been around for a while will understand exactly why I have a battery cutoff switch on this machine. But if you don't, it's because I lost one to a mouse that caused a fire. So anyway, let's turn a little pump on. As you can see, we pumped up. And then the uh, I've got the regulator set to not go any higher than that. But um, you can you can go all the way down to like six pounds, eight pounds. You can see, read that on the gauge. And the gauge is actually very accurate. I was, I was impressed with that. And then when you get ready to air it back down, you can do it right here from this little switch. You can air down all four tires and pump up all four tires at, uh, at one time. Very, very handy. This is the washer fluid bottle uh, for the windshield wiper. That's a Polaris windshield wiper kit on a Polaris flip up windshield with a windshield washer kit as well. And then under here we have our uh, control unit and distribution block for the Lux rock lights. Let's just stick this back on right quick so it don't look so funny. All right, so the rock lights right here, right here. They're super bright white LEDs that are magnetic. They stick to metal. If you need to put it in a place where you don't have metal, they sell a little metal plates that you can mount with these uh, push rivets and then the rock light will stick to it and it also acts as a heat sink for the led itself because they are super bright so moving back from there i got little grizz tech um, guards on each side of the radiator they protect the radiator and the fan from tires throwing mud and rocks up into the wheel well uh, those actually came from alaska which is uh that's pretty cool i got something on here from alaska <laughs> All right, so moving on from there, we have our shocks. Now these are the original shocks that came with the buggy, but they have G-Force racing spring kits and internal valving. I had originally, I'm, this is one thing I'm talking about that I had on here before. I had a, a shock therapy spring kit on here to begin with. And to be perfectly honest, the, vi the I keep saying vehicle, the car, the side-by-side, -side, the UTV, the general, uh, Lieutenant Tan, LT. Anyway, it rode a little worse than it did with the factory spring. The factory springs actually rode pretty good, but I wanted it better and I tried shock therapy and 
that actually made it worse. It had terrible body roll with that kid on there. The guy at G-Force Racing, uh, he lives up in Tennessee. His, that's where his shop is. He rides uh, Windrock and Hatfield and um, Royal Blue and all the parks that we like to ride. So he knows the terrain, he knows these machines. And he set this thing up uh, just perfect. I, I took it up there, told him what I wanted, told him how it rode currently. And he went through, did internal valving, and then did the spring kits, and then uh, recharged them. And I took it out and took it for a ride, and I was super impressed. It, the, it, it rode good from the factory, but I would say the ride was, was doubled as far as comfort and smoothness over the rough terrain after he got done with it. Um, now that I've put these long arms and, and bigger portals and all this stuff on it, made it wider and taller, I am going to probably end up taking it back to him to have him retune it. But I need to get it out and run it before I know, you know, I have any feedback to give him. So kind of waiting on that at this point. Um, allergies are getting to me, by the way. Sorry about my voice and my sniffles. <laughs> all right, so attached to the shop, we got Super ATV limit straps. Now, I know what you're thinking, hold up. You put long arms on here to get more suspension travel. You like to rock crawl, so you need as much travel and articulation as you can get. Why are you using limit straps? Well, I actually fine tuned the length of my limit strap purchase so that I lost maybe an inch at the most of downward travel in the front and about three quarters of an inch in the back. So very very minimal loss but they do a lot of work to help catch all this weight out here on the end of these arms you got probably i'd guess at least 150 pounds hanging out here on the end of these arms not counting the weight of the arms themselves and the only thing that's uh, catching all that when it drops out is the piston inside of this little two inch shock body here and it's got seals around it and it's it's got seals below it and when that thing hammers into the bottom of that shock it's not doing anything in there any good so these limit straps stretch just they catch and stretch and stop all that weight from causing damage to my shocks which wouldn't take too long to damage them with that much weight hanging off the end of them so small 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 amount of of downward travel trade-off for saving my shocks from catastrophic failure so I, i'll take that um next up we've got rhino 2.0 from super atv axles uh, all four corners these axles are actually for the uh, turbo s because these long arms take this 64 inch general and turn it into a 72 inch general so the turbo s is also 72 inches and the splines on either end match up with what's in the general so these are dir directly uh, plug and play so to speak uh, for my build so i was i was very happy about that because i had my choice of axles and i didn't have to cobble one together or have them special made or anything like that. I just bought them off the shelf and they work perfect. Now talking about the arms, they're HCR long arms, uh, long travel. They are boxed, they are extremely strong, extremely rigid. They're designed very well. I do have a couple of little things that I'm not super pleased with. I don't like the bushings that they're using. They haven't upgraded their bushings to the new style players bushings with the wear plate and the O-rings and all that good stuff. Their bushings haven't changed since the uh, invention of, I guess, their, their Polaris arms, but they're still using the same type of bushing that you would use in like the old 800s or anything pre-2017. Um, not super, super happy about that, but we'll see how it does. And the other thing is they're not adjustable. Uh, I would have expected something that of this quality and at this price point to let you at least have camber adjustment on uh, all four sides of the machine, but they are not adjustable. 
Now, the, they are set to factory geometry, so as long as everything is tight and 100%, then you're gonna have pretty good alignment. But once things begin to wear, even just a little, you're gonna, you're gonna start seeing the back tires lay down and you're gonna see the front tires maybe starting to lay down a little bit and your toe is gonna get off um, continuously. So we'll have to, we have to see how the bushings hold up, so see how often they need to be replaced in order to keep the thing somewhat aligned. But uh, that's the only downside to those that, I, that I'm aware of at this time. Uh, at the end of the arms, we have our ball joints. I had Keller ball joints on here before when I was running Super ATV's offset arms and uh, high clearance offset arms but they weren't long travel. Um, but the Keller uh, screw on top housing would not fit inside of this cup on the end of these arms. So I went to, I had some Super ATV high end ball joints that are very much like the RCV ball joints, except the rubber boot, they have you super glue the boot to the ball joint after it's pressed in. And I had a lot of trouble with that stuff, trying to make it stick, and I, I just wasn't real keen on, on gluing the rubber boot to the ball joint. So uh, I ended up not really ever using those. I used them for a couple of rides, and, and I took them off. I actually ended up gluing the boot on with JB Well just to make the thing try to stay on there better. And it did pretty good, but when I pressed them out, the boot still came off, even with that stuff. So. So these are actually kryptonite ball joints. Um, a couple of my friends have run these and, and didn't like them. I'm not sure what the reason was. This is my first set, so I haven't you know, put them through the test yet, but I do know that they do have a lifetime warranty and kryptonite has a no questions asked policy when it comes to their lifetime warranty. If you break it, they replace it. It doesn't matter if you're racing. It doesn't matter if you're rock bouncing. They don't care what you are doing. They do wanna know what you're doing so that they can see if there's a way to strengthen or maybe change the design to make them even more durable. But they will honor the warranty. So I do have a couple of extra I'm gonna keep in my box and I've got the tool that allows you to put the, um, the ball joints in and out of on the machine while you're out on the trail. And the boot is actually mounted to this nut that's underneath, that screws on from the underside of the arm or the back side of the ball joint, the business side of the ball joint, how about that? And the boot is attached to it, so it's, it's a great design. Plus it's got a nice grease fitting here where you can just ram this thing full of grease until it squishes out the bottom and then push all the contaminants out, wipe it up, and you should be good to go, so. All right, my camera is alerting me that it's about to overheat and get hot and shut down, so I'm gonna pause this video for a second and I'll be back with you. All right, let's continue. So along with the ACR uh, long arm kit, it came with tie rods and I'm using the ACR tie rod tubes for the length. Um, I probably could use tubes from uh, any Turbo S um, tie rod kit, but since this came with them and they seem like they're very nice tubes, so obviously I'm just gonna use them. Plus, got that right there, that's important. Um, but they also come with heim joints and a clevis uh, connection on that end and heim joints on this end. And if you know me at all, you know I, I am not a fan of heim joints. They do not hold up or work well in this Southeast environment. Uh, you can lube them things up all you want, get out on the trail and before you even get lunch time, they're gonna be just about seized up and causing you all kind of problems. So these are kryptonite um, ball joints on the end of the tie rod. I know these are ball joints. This is also a ball joint. It's basically the same thing. But this is an automotive style. Um, so this is what you would, like you would find on a, a truck or something. It's the same kind of joint. Also has a nice grease fitting where you can pump it full of grease, push the contaminants out around the boot, and then wipe it up to clean up. Now on the other end, I'm also using the kryptonite uh, sockets on that end, the ball sockets on the end of the, the steering rack. 
You may notice that none of this is really attached. Well, it's attached, but it's not secured right now and the boot's off and you can see the inside of the steering rack. And that's because that's the last part of this upgrade. Uh, I haven't gotten those parts yet and I'm not going to tell you about them, but I am potentially going to have a major, major, major steering upgrade to this machine uh, in the next week or two. And as soon as that happens, you'll know about it because I'm going to be making video on that. But I'm very excited about it. And uh, hopefully I have more on that pretty soon. All right, so moving out from the center of the machine down toward uh, the tire and wheel here, you may notice the portals. Well, before, this is another point I'm going to have to compare. Before, I had super uh, ATV portals. They were 4-inch. They were single idler which means uh, they only had three gears in the portal box itself. He had the gear attached to the input from the axle, the gear that attaches to the output shaft that goes to your wheel and your brake rotor and everything. And then you have what's called the idler gear that goes between them. And that gear is responsible for transferring, transferring power from the top gear to the bottom gear. Now in a single idler setup, that's just one gear that is responsible for that. And on my last ride at Hatfield McCoy, we were in a pretty bad trail in Bear Wallow, and I was trying to go up this bad trail, and I ended up breaking the idler gear in that back portal on that side. And that was the catalyst that began this, this uh, round of upgrades. Uh, when I broke that, that idler gear, that tire locked up and it wouldn't turn, so we had to kind of put it in four wheel drive and run the machine backwards and forwards a little bit to get that tire turning to break the rest of the teeth off, unfortunately, just to get the tire so it could roll so we could get the machine out of the woods. And we were probably a good 50, 60 miles from camp when that happened. Uh, it was deep, deep in the woods and way out and like through like three or four other towns, you know. <laughs> so it was, a, it was a good ways away, but uh, we did roll back into camp and everything was still attached and that, that tire wasn't pulling anymore obviously, but uh, it also held up really well and was still in place, didn't have no bearing troubles even though the housing had split open and all the oil had leaked out um, when it spit the gear teeth out at the side of the housing. So, but anyway, uh, I know Polaris has, I mean, Super ETV has lifetime warranty on their porta boxes but I was completely unsure if that was even gonna be covered under warranty. Turns out it was. Uh, I do have a replacement uh, portal box right over here, but I wanted to go ahead and upgrade uh, to dual idlers. And unfortunately, Super ATV does not offer a dual idler setup, portal setup for the general yet. So hopefully they will in the future, but as of yet they didn't, but High Lifter did. So I ended up going with high lifter portals, and I have to say I'm very, very impressed with the engineering on these things. The, the boxes are not, um, they're not cast aluminum, they're not even billet aluminum, they're forged, they're forged steel. And from what I understand, everything, all the internals are also forged, and they're extremely, extremely strong units. The back plates are done very well, they got a lot of strength to them, they're thick, and they got um, the ridges fold, uh, folded on both ends for uh, rigidity and strength and they're also vented. They, they included a plug on the top of the portals that would allow you to vent uh, the boxes if you want to. <clears throat> I know there's a lot of discussion on whether you should vent your portals or not. Super ATV says don't and Highlifter says well you can if you want to you want you asked us to let you do it so here's you a plug to do it with so I'm not sure if they they agree with it or not but they did offer the the possibility uh, even the guys I've seen their video on at Slick Rock when they're talking about portals they they I, from what I understood they used to vent their portals and then they stopped doing it because they said it was unnecessary as well but my thing is if you can do it, why not do it? Because it is a gearbox. Every gearbox on this machine is vented, and these are going to go through temperature changes out there on the trail. If you're rock crawling and climbing steep hills, then you're gonna warm these boxes up, and then at the top of that hill or the bottom of the next hill, you're liable to go through a cold, clear stream, or 
you know, a, a mud hole or something like that, and this, that cold water is going to contract. Okay, where were we? Sorry, my camera cut off. It got hot. Um, it's recording at 4K, 60 frames a second, and uh, even though we did just have a rain, it's still kind of warm in here, but anyway, uh, moving on. The temperature change on the portals. When that cold water hits that box, the temperature is going to drop, the air inside is going to condense, and it's going to create a little bit of a vacuum. And the atmospheric pressure is going to cause that vacuum to try to equalize, and it will over time. And the only way it can do that is by pulling air in through the seals that protect the boxes from the mud and water and just outside contaminants in general. And all the fine particles that your seal is keeping out are going to get pulled in uh, when that air is pulled in slowly over time. And it will cause your seals to wear out prematurely, in my opinion, in my opinion. So uh, I, I ran my own vent lines. I took the, in the front and the back, I did it the same way. I just put a, um, a bushing and then a, a one eighth, um, I mean a quarter inch barbed plug, 90 over, run it to some quarter inch vent line, and then the two of them uh, go into a T, and then the one line coming out of the T goes up into the frame on the opposite side from where the front diff is vented. So, very well protected, and I've got clamps on the hoses, not gonna have any leaks, so I'm uh, very happy with the way that turned out, I have to say. And while we're on that subject, let's talk about the brake lines. The HCR uh, long arm kit came with one brake line. That's, that's another negative point I have uh, with the way they, they include, what they included in the kit. They said in the rear to simply remove your brake lines from some of the factory clips that would allow them to stretch out long enough to reach the end of the arms and your brake calipers that way. Um, I, am, I am not a fan of, of that at all, just letting your brake lines just kind of hang loose and stretch out to wherever they need to go. They included one brake line for the front, and what they want you to do is take the longer one from this side and move it to this side, and then include their one longer one back on this side. And that was, uh, the, the, that was their solution, so. Not super happy with that. Not to mention, I also have the portals, which cause, you know, need even longer brake lines than what they sent, or what mine could stretch by far. Now, High Lifter, they included three brake lines. And they, re they included the two in the rear, and they included one for the front, so you could swap the sides and then put the other one on this side, which is fine. But they also didn't count on someone, you know, ha buying their kit that had long arms as well. So those brake lines were not long enough either. So I ended up making my own. I went to Pegasus Racing Supplies online. I ordered 20 feet of 1 8 stainless steel braided uh, hose. And then I ordered some 90 banjo fittings, some 20 degree banjos, and a couple of fittings for the brake line distribution block in the back. And I made my own. They're all compression style, and they are every bit as good as the crimpons that are made in the shops, if not even better. Because I accidentally dropped one of these heavy calipers on the brake line when I was uh, putting everything together, and there was absolutely no damage to that brake line whatsoever at the connector like I've seen the crimpton factory lines do. I've seen them stretch to the point where they looked like they were coming apart. Even the outside jacket got pulled out of the connector, but on this, none of that happened. And I can stand on that brake pedal with both feet until my knees start shaking and I don't get a single bit of movement in that pedal, so I don't have any sort of leaks. I'm, again, happy with the way that turned out. Uh, another thing that was an upgrade from the high lifter portals was the brake rotor. The brake rotor that came with it is 13 inches in diameter. That joker's huge. That's one thing I've always had a problem with running the, the 35s I had before these tires. These are 37s. But the small brake rotor, excuse me, that came on the Super ATV Portal 
along with the factory caliper was just not nearly enough for this thing to be able to stop effectively. I don't think I could have slid the front tires in mud, much less on good hard packed dirt or, or asphalt. One of the other upgrades I made was to take the, there's a three caliper, a three piston caliper that comes on the general, but it only has one good size piston and the next one is smaller and the one on the end is very small. Um, they were okay, but they weren't super strong, but they were good enough to put on the back. So I actually put the front calipers from the general on the back. Then I took the weenie little two piston, tiny little dinky caliper that was on the back and then I threw it in the trash. And then I ordered from High Lifter the brackets to connect the four seat Turbo S caliper to the front of my general here. And then I ordered the Turbo S four seater calipers from Polaris, which is one of the biggest calipers that Polaris has made to date. And I put that on the front of this general with these 37s and that giant rotor. I can now slide the tires just about anywhere I want. So really happy with how that turned out. That was a great upgrade. All right, moving on. Now we're or at least to the, about the middle of the hood here on our walkthrough. We, we got a long way to go, but don't worry. There's, there's a lot less talk about once we get out of this front end. Um, when I broke that portal, it also twisted the center section of the drive shaft. It twisted it good. It, it probably rolled it almost a good 360 degrees from one end to the other. And it was uh, making a heck of a lot of noise. And I guess that happened when the portal went. So again, about 50, 60 miles from camp. And we had, I had to run it in full drive most of the time because this tire wasn't pulling. I just had that one on that backside and it wouldn't really do much by itself. So I was in, in four wheel drive quite a bit of the time and I guess from the unusual movement of that torqued uh, drive shaft plus the vibration, it caused the pinion seal on my front diff to wiggle out of its, out of the housing and ride back on the pinion shaft. And so it lost all of its oil too. I'm not sure exactly when that happened, but I do know that this inside wheel was completely covered in oily dirt and grime and yuck and it, it was just a disaster. It had run down the lower arm and into the, over the portal and in, into the wheel and just made a huge mess. So I don't know how long, but that joker had been running dry as well and it had been in operation a lot of that time and it was still working when I decided to take it out because of that seal. But because of all the trouble I had on my uh, four seat 900 um, front diff, the one that caught fire, and I, and I promised the front diff had no reason, we had no bearing on the reason it caught fire. It, it really was that stupid mouse, but I felt like burning it down sometimes because of that diff. But anyway, I took that diff out and I sent it off to Sandcraft in uh, Phoenix and they put their, their bulletproof or bomb proof kit inside of that diff. They reconditioned the housing. They put their bomb proof internals in it. They set the pinion or the ring gear and pinion gear lash. And then while they were going through it, they notified me to let me know the only thing they found wrong with the inside of that diff, even after all that it had been through, was a few of the H clips were bent. The H clips are little tiny little clips that look like the letter H and they hold the rollers, which is what actually engages your four wheel drive motion uh, on the axles. So they had aftermarket ones of those that were high quality and, and I had them replace those as well. So they put all new seals, all new bearings and all new internals except for the ring and pinion gear and um, the output hubs, which there was nothing wrong with any of that and they ship it back to me and I've got it installed and I haven't run it yet other than just testing it around here. But um, when they build it themselves, they offer you a lifetime warranty on all the internals. I, I doubt that covers splitting the case open, but it has a lifetime warranty on all the internals. So like I keep saying, I'm very happy with how that turned out. 
Now connected to the front diff is the drive shaft or the prop shaft, however you want to call it. And it has been upgraded from that twisted up one from the OEM, which actually held up really well, I have to say. I've been running that for over two years now with the factory bearings. And if I hadn't have had that issue, it would probably still be in there. But I went ahead and did an upgrade to a Super ATV Rhino prop shaft. Now, one thing I wanna talk about here is on their site, they did not offer the drive shaft for this machine. They had it for the regular general, not the XP branded, but they had it for the regular general from 17 to 23. And they had it for the two seat general XP from 2020 and up, but not for the four seat. But see, that seems strange to me. I, I was like, well, if it'll fit the two seater, then the front section and the back section of that drive shaft will definitely work because the only difference on the four seater is they do add a center section that is the only difference. So, but all the generals, no matter if it's an XP or not, all share the same drive shaft. So I'm thinking to myself, the only reason they said it works for the two seat XP is because it works for the two seat general and they're the same. So why wouldn't it be, why wouldn't it work for the four seat? So I went on to Polaris's online parts diagrams and I dug through and sure enough, all three drive shafts had the same, shared the same part numbers for all three sections for both the XP and non XP four seater. So I, um, I got in touch with my, my contact person at Super ATV and I told him my thoughts and he said, well, of course you're welcome to go ahead and try it, but I just can't tell you that it's gonna fit because our fitment team says that it won't. And I said, all right, well, I wanna try it anyway. So I bought it and I installed it and it worked fine. It fit fine, everything fit precisely as it should. There was nothing wrong. Um, now I did order their hard mount carrier bearings. Um, I've heard tell that they make a lot of noise and they, they, they have a lot of feedback and vibration and, and if you have a bad part in your, in your drive line, but even if you don't have bad part in your drive line, you can, you can hear them. They are gonna create noise in most uh, situations. So, and even CCI who custom makes drive shafts for everything under the sun, including side-by-sides, they, I had a CCI driveline drive, uh, prop shaft in my blue 900 four seater from them and they warned me against using those hard mount carrier bearings. They said to use the rubber isolated bearings like the OEM uses, but they had an upgraded version of it. So I, I kept that in mind, but I went ahead and ordered the hard mount bearings because I wasn't sure if the factory bearings were gonna fit on this drive shaft. So I put it all together that way and everything fit perfectly and I took pictures of it and I sent the pictures to Super ATV and uh, I was told that the pictures would be passed along to the fitment team. I'm not really sure if anything's gonna come of it or, or whatever, but I did do that. Um, but then I took it out for a test ride and the first thing I heard when I got over about 10 miles an hour was drive line noise coming from those two bearings. I, I knew immediately what it was because I've heard that sound before when my factory bearing back in the day in my 800 four seater used to go out about every two rides. That thing would start growling and these bearings sounded exactly like that. So I went ahead and ordered two new OEM bearings, just crossing my fingers that they would fit, pulled the drive shaft and everything back out of it, took those hard mount bearings off and I put the OEM style, what people call the Toyota Tacoma bearings back on it and they fit perfect. I mean, there was no difference in, in the size, the, the thickness of the bearing, the, the pressure of pressing it on. Um, they, they fit it just like they were made for it. Whew. Excuse me, I need another refreshment top up. So with the OEM carrier bearings on that drive shaft, uh, the drive line runs completely silent now, no issues whatsoever, no movement. I did go through and check. I mean, my front diff is brand new, straight from Sandcraft, and the transmission uh, is just fine. I don't have any run out whatsoever on my output shaft from the transmission, 
and no problems or binding in any of the gears or bearings. So there should have been really no reason for that noise other than that's just a you know nature of the beast of those type of bearings in some occasions. So anyway, silent, a, a super nice upgraded drive line with good bearings and it runs completely silent. So that's what I ended up with. Now the drive line itself is, is awesome. It's nice and thick, it's heavy, it's quality built. You can just feel it by looking at it and holding it in your hand. The factory prop shaft, drive line, drive shaft, whatever, had a, a CV joint on the input end and then a CV joint on the output end on this up here, but in the center section, it had U joints. So I went ahead, or when I replaced it with this Rhino drive line, now I have CV joints in all four locations. So that's, it's gonna be nice and smooth running and, and can't wait to give it a test out there in the woods and the rocks. Now before we move too much further back, let me uh, touch on the tires and wheels. I kind of forgot that part while I was talking about brake rotors and, and calipers. But these are 37 by 10 and a half by 18 uh, MRT X-Rox DD tires. They're the sticky version and they are sticky. I have been super impressed with these things. I've been on two or yeah, two rides with them now and uh, I was super impressed with how they performed just not only in the rock but just in just general trail use as well and then i have a uh, muscle race wheel um, six by 18 wheels they're uh, machined and they are one piece and they are super strong they don't have or they they have a five inch back spacing and only one inch um, inset on this end which makes the outside of the wheel flat but that is actually kind of what i was looking for when you have a, a deep dish style wheel, that is a good place for uh, it to fall into rock that sticks out on some of the trails that we ride on and get you hung up or even break the wheel by getting, getting it caught just right around that rock. And when you have a flat surface out here, you know, relatively flat surface, then your wheel does get scratched up more, but it also helps keep in, the rocks from getting inside of your your wheel and tire set up and helps it just pass right by the rock. It may scrub on it, but it will just go right past it without getting hung up on it. And I'm talking about like corners and edges and things that just kind of jut out that can get inside of there and really get you hung up and break your wheel. So that's the reason I went with this style. But because of that, because of that five inch offset and on a six inch wheel, I did run wheel spacers just to set them back out a little bit away from all the internals and the working parts of the, the portals, get them away from the brake rotor and the caliper. There was very, very little clearance in there. I think they even say you're not supposed to use five inch backspace wheels, even on 18s on these portals. So now I don't, now I've got four inch, which is perfectly acceptable. That made the entire stance of the machine about 84 inches wide, which its width to me directly correlates and matches its height. Uh, at the typical measurement points, front and rear on this machine, it's sitting at about 27, 27 and a half inches. So it's, uh, it's tall. It's very tall, but it's also very stable. When I had my four inch portals on here and the 35s, it was obviously um, you know, a little bit lower, about three inches lower than it was now, but it was also quite a bit more narrow and it was super stable at that point. I estimated I could lean this thing over to the side a good 45, 50 degrees and it was still just stable enough to continue driving forward in a rut or whatever I happened to be uh, jammed up in. So this one being that much wider and only three inches taller, is really going to make a difference. Well, it's gonna be more than three inches because of the length of the arms. I'm not sure of, I guess I got about six inches of height difference because it was at about 21 inches. And the longer arms push the body up because the tires are further away at a down angle. So yeah, that's it's about a six inch difference, 21 to 27. But I also added quite a bit of width, so. I went from 77 to about 84, so about seven inches more width. But uh, let's see, 
did forget to mention these are bead locks, which should be obvious because it has a nice orange ring on it that I had powder coated locally. Um, if you need some good powder work done and you don't mind traveling a bit or sending your stuff, you know, shipping it, then um, the guy I use is in Macon, Georgia. Is, the name of the company is Dicron, D-I-E-C-R-O-N. He does an excellent, excellent job. If you go around here and you take it to a local powder coater and you got something that's too big to fit in a standard size oven, they're going to take it to him to have it done anyway because he's just got that kind of equipment and he's just that good at it. So anyway, we're gonna, he, he did the arms, they come in raw. He did the beadlock rings um, and he's done my, my arms and my rock sliders and my beadlock rings for uh, several, several different upgrades and builds on these machines. I, I've been, I've been uh, getting, using his services now for many, many years. Uh, first name basis, matter of fact. Anyway, so like I said, moving on. I did mention the Polaris flip-up windshield, the windshield wiper, uh, the Polaris roof, the poly roof that actually came with the machine. And this is the Polaris canvas uh, upper doors, which fit really good on the General. The Polaris versions fit like crap on the Razor, but on the General, they actually fit really good, and I'm, I'm very, very happy with them. I like the way they they uh, fit, and I like the, the way they, how durable they are, because I have rubbed these things on bushes and trees and briars and stickers and just all manner of things, and they don't have a single, they're, they're scratched up, and they need a good wash, but they're not fraying, they're not torn, they're just, they're holding up super well. And then on the back, I have the Polaris glass rear window as well. Um, haven't had any problems with it. Been very happy with the entire enclosure setup. Matter of fact, I'm so happy with it, I never take it off. In the summer, when it's warm, we ride, we just roll these windows down to put a little strap on them, and then flip that windshield up, and it's basically like having an open air vehicle just for the top. And anybody's going to be running a top, keep the sun off of you, so it's, um, it never comes off. And we end up usually riding when it's cool more than when it's hot anyway, so a lot of times we have them windows up and the windshield cracked, and then our seat heaters off and on, depending on how warm they get. But anyway, that's more on the inside. We'll talk about that later. So I am actually on my fourth set of rock sliders. The first set I had, I, th I would say probably held up the best. If these don't hold up any more, any better than the last uh, three or the last two sets, then I'll probably go back with the ones I had originally. They were called APOC, A-P-O-C, um, and they were made specifically for the General XP, and they were tough. I have to give them that. They were very tough. Uh, the sets I've had since then. Um, both sets only held up for one ride, and I just bent the crap out of them. I'm not going to mention who they came from, just out of respect, but um, both both sets were were even hard to take off. They were so bent up the last, the last two rides that I went on with two different sets. So I'm trying these. I just like the way these looked, and I actually wanted to get away from the ones that were designed as a tree kicker because this machine is getting so wide the tree kicker part of it no longer really functions as a tree kicker, and all it is is a tree catcher. So if a small tree was to come along this side and go into this little wheel well right here, with that um, tree kicker sticking out and the tire sticking out further than that, then all that's going to do is make it very difficult to get off that little tree other than with a chainsaw. But with it open like this, I should be able to just cut hard to the right and back up and walk it uh, right back out of there if that were to happen. So really all I'm using these for now is rock sliders to protect the, the rocker panel on the, on the body work. Now these are from Thumper Fab. They seem like some pretty, uh, pretty heavy gauge material. I'm assuming that's carbon steel. I love the way that the frame mounts are made, the way they mount to the frame itself. They are done like ORB. Um, Justin at ORB does his. The one thing I don't really like is the, the rock slider itself is held to those mounting points with three bolts from underneath. 
So right down there where the rocks are gonna be sliding, I've got three bolts that are actually holding this thing to the, to the machine. Um, we'll have to see what the rocks do to those bolt heads and how these actually hold up. I like the little accents. I like having it black with the tan accents. And these are actually what you step on when you're getting in and out. So that was one of the reasons I wanted to use these because they're gonna make getting in and out of this thing as tall as it is easier than trying to stand on a, on a tube that's up close to the body. But if these do not work out, then I'll have to go back to using the APOC ones like I did before. Or if you or somebody you know could make me some, some rock slider slash tree kickers that actually fit this machine, that would be just even better. That would be fantastic. What I would like is something that looks like the factory design rock sliders, but are not made of tinfoil. They start up here and they have a hoop that comes in here and they also have a hoop back here that goes over the gas cap and it's mashed on the other side with the hoop. And then they, they're tucked at the bottom and then they kick out at the top as a tree kicker. So I would like something like that, but ones that actually come out far enough to act as a tree kicker and extend far enough into the wheel wheel again to act as a tree kicker, but allow the tire into its full compression as well. If you, if you know somebody that can make those things, you could put them in touch with me or give me their information so I can get in touch with them. Or if you can do it, just you know, hit me up because I would, I would really like to, to work with somebody on doing that. So let's see, while we're moving along through the center section, let's talk about the skid plate. I'll see if I can reach down and look up at it. It's a super ATV skid plate. It is a UHMW material, but it's a proprietary version that they have, and it's super slick. It slides over the rocks really well. It's in several pieces. Um, it's actually in five different pieces, six if you use the front piece, which I didn't, but because I have a frame stiffener up there from Super ATV. I forgot to mention it, but yeah, it, it acts as the front skid plate as well as stiffening up those lower uh, mounting tabs for the A-arms. But this is in five pieces, which means it's, you can take just sections off of it that you, if you need to, and it all fits together really well. I'm very happy with it. So moving into the back, there's not very much to talk about back here because it's a repeat. It's still got the G4 shocks, still got the Super ATV limit straps, the ACR long arms, the high lifter portals, the, the MRT tires and the MRW wheels, the Rhino axles, the Super ATV Rhino, Rhino 2.0 axles. Let me get all that out. It's kind of a mouthful. <laughs> and then this is the Polaris rear bumper, but I would not actually bump it into anything. It would, it would fold in half if you did. <laughs> it's more of a decorative piece. Um, the machine did need something down, down here just to kind of add a little bit of uh, pizzazz, let's say. But all the ones that I've seen that are actual real bumpers are just too big and chunky. This one has a great look to it, but like I said, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't trust pushing that thing into the Stay Puff Marshmallow Man. It's liable to just, just fold up in half. Matter of fact, I've got it mounted as, as good as I can get it, and yet I can still wiggle it just like that. <laughs> eh, not, not awesome, but whatever. Um, now back here, I've got my GGB uh, muffler that goes along with my Gilliman Innovations tune on my ECU, which I'll talk about in a second. First, let's cover the muffler. Uh, I love it. I love the way it sounds. It's very deep. Um, it does have a, a little bit of a ho hollow metal sound, but that's what I like about it for some reason. It, it's not high pitched like the Bumblebee. It's very deep which to me with the, the combined sound just is fantastic. The one thing that I do love about it and the reason I went with this particular one is it's a welded baffle muffler. It has no packing in it. The factory, the OEM mufflers and most of your aftermarket mufflers all use that fiberglass packing material inside to deaden the sound. But your spark arrester in the end of your muffler as that material begins to break down and get trying to blow out of the exhaust will get caught in that spark arrester and it will cause your engine to start overheating uh, for seemingly no reason whatsoever. Um, we've had it in our group. I've had it myself. Uh, you, you can spend all day cleaning your radiator and checking the, the, the levels and trying to burp the system and looking for air and you won't find it. There's nothing wrong with any of that. 
it's your spark arrestor is packed with that packing material and it's causing your engine to lose power and overheat. So this muffler is, like I said, it's internally welded with baffles and it has no packing material. It will never stop up. So that's why I used it. Plus it just sounds fantastic. Love it. Wade hates it. He hates it, but he don't hate it as much as he pretends to. He just likes to give me a hard time about it. But the reason I ended up with that is because it matches the tune that I have on my ECU, which is behind that uh, driver's side passenger seat in a compartment back there. Uh, and the reason I have a tuned ECU is not because I needed more horsepower. I mean, I'm, these, I forgot to mention these portals have a 45% gear reduction. I mean, my top speed at this point with these 30, 37s is pretty probably around 40, 45 miles an hour if I had to guess, if that. Um, and that's wound out. But anyway, the reason I got it tuned was when I first got this machine, like I said, I had everything in the shop ready to put on it to do my build. And I put my four inch portals on it. I put my 35 inch canine stickies on it and all the other things that I was doing. I backed it out of the shop into the driveway and drove down the driveway about 20 feet and it threw an engine code. So obviously I was extremely concerned at that moment because the engine had about two hours on it and I had just done a complete build and now it was throwing an engine code. But after I checked the code and did some online research, I learned that uh, Polaris had included code in their ECU to try to protect these machines from uh, burning belts. And a lot of the reason people burn belts is because they just run their machines in high all the time. They rock crawl in high. They mud bog in high on their high lifter. That's a terrible thing to do. Run them in low. Run them in, if you're off the pavement, off the hard pack, or you've got a hill in sight, or a rock, or a mud hole, run it in low. I, I don't know how many high lifter belts I've seen smoked from someone trying to mud bog in high. That's just, it's, it's not, the fault of the driver per se as it is just a lack of education on how these things are, are should be operated and that's exactly what that uh, software is for it, it watches for an RPM difference between your engine and your wheel speed and it knows where the acceptable range is and if you get outside of that range Okay, sorry, camera got hot and shut off again. Um, I really got to start powering this thing externally so this quits happening. But anyway, as I was saying, if your engine speed and your wheel speed are mismatched for more than a few seconds, uh, the ECU is going to throw an engine code, put it in limp mode, and you have to take it to the dealer to get it reset. And then the dealer will see that and they will then be able to educate you on why that happened. And so a lot less belts are probably getting burned out there because of that software. But for somebody like me, that is a bad thing because on my four inch portals from Super, I had 30% gear reduction on 35 inch tires and it only came, the, the machine came with 30 inch tires. So as far as the drivetrain and the motor and the ECU were concerned, it was running on about 26s, which obviously is a big difference in uh, <laughs> the, the speed mismatch between the the wheels and, and the, the transmission, so it threw an engine code, and rightly so. But I did some research and I had to find someone that could get rid of that, and Gilliman Innovations up in Michigan. Uh, he was able to take care of that. He tuned the ECU, and he tuned it for the, uh, my uh, environment down here, and the machine runs better than it did new. That code is uh, taken out. And with that muffler, I have about a 15 horsepower increase in all. So not that I really needed horsepower increase. I mean, my, to me, 30, 30 miles an hour is about top speed. And that's even on the road, especially with portals. You're not supposed to run them at really high speeds anyway. Um, so the, the horsepower wasn't needed, but it did um, liven up the machine quite a bit. And the throttle response and everything has improved, so I'm really happy with the way that turned out. There's not a whole lot more back here to talk about other than I got a little D-ring hanging off my receiver hitch down here. 
Um, one last thing, well, two last things, two things, the fender flaps. This is the Mudbuster fender kit for the General XP. The front one is fantastic. It goes from the front all the way down past the lower body here. It sticks out a good bit. It's got a nice little shape to it. Follows the factory fender. Looks good. The back one, guys, what were you thinking? It, uh, it's, it's good back here. It's nice and wide, got a nice shape, follows the fender, but then it stops right here. That's it, as far as it goes. So you got all this room up here for the tire to just sling crap all over the back of the, the body and all over the back windows and onto the, this back window, which is where all this mess right here came from that I can't get off. And then it covers the, the sides of the back window and it throws stuff all on top of the coolers and the dry boxes. So, and I even asked them, I was like, can we, can we work together and come up with a design to finish this kit? I've, I've got one in mind and I never even heard back from them. They completely ignored that email. But, uh, and I even tried to call and never got a return call. Uh, which is sad because when I first put this kit on, they actually saw that video and they made a comment about it and made a comment on how they were gonna take my suggestions uh, into consideration. So uh, I haven't heard anything since, unfortunately. So what I did is I went on to uh, McMaster Car. They have an app and I ordered some 3 6 UHMW material, a piece that was 12 inches by 24 inches. Um, I should have went with a 36, so I could have extended them on back here, because as you can see, there's like a, this little cutout right here where it could have just went straight back, but no, not a big deal anyway. But I got this material in, I used my miter saw over there, and I measured, and I drew lines, and I cut, and they were actually were pretty simple to design. The hard part was heating it up and bending it um, and getting it the bends to line up correctly with following these fenders. But these two pieces I made with a miter saw and a heat gun and a vise. And then I drilled some holes, put some uh, these uh, push rivets in, heated it up back here on the bench and then brought it over here and I had gloves on, but I squeezed it down to mold it into this to shape to fit on top of the mud uh, mud buster flap and then bend it right here so that they can go together and then put this one little thumb screw in i can take this thumb screw out on both sides and the bed can still flip up and it separates right here really happy with the way they turned out uh my buddies like them even wade said that it might as well be factory from the way they look and i couldn't couldn't agree more i did a, not to toot my own horn but i did a good job on those the other thing to talk about while we're still on the outside is my dry box and cooler. These are from Super ATV. Now they're very well made. They got excellent seals on it and they fit in here and I got two of them. The thing is, they weren't meant to have two of them. They're meant to have one. Now, guys, come on. Every manufacturer out there, listen, we need a dry box and a wet box in the back of every one of these side-by-sides that are out there riding trails, period. You need a place for dry goods, you need a place for your cold stuff and your drinks. Why just give us the one box? We need two, we always need two, period. It could be a big box that's separated into two containers, it could be two separate, I don't, just whatever, we need two. So this box came with brackets to mount it on the left side or the right side or the center but not a way to mount two of them together and they wouldn't even fit they almost fit it was i'd say it needed about two inches of clearance and they would both have fit and dropped all the way down to the deck here what was holding them apart was the hinge that goes through the lid uh, is a metal rod and it sticks out and it's got this plastic cap on the end of it so all I did is remove those rods, cut them off of my chop saw right at the edge of the cooler, slid them back in, and then by spacing them up an inch and a half, which is the width of this two by four, they fit in the bed just perfectly. So I've got two two by fours down here, and, I'm, and I went through the bottom of them into the coolers to mount the coolers, uh, or the boxes, and then when I dropped it in, I went through the bottom of the body and the frame pieces and actually uh, mounted the two by four box contraption to the frame from underneath. 
So once that's in there, it ain't coming out and it, it would actually be quite a challenge to get the thing back out. I've never taken it out and I don't plan to. I did paint the two by fours uh, black, but the pressure washer kind of ate that off and you know what, I ain't worried about it. That's treated wood, that's gonna be in there for a long time and I'll worry about it then. Actually, it was three more things I need to talk about. The, um, the last thing being the dirt clutch inside of my clutch housing here. That is one thing that I will never run another one of these side-by-sides without is that dirt clutch, just like the portals. The next time I decide to get a new side-by-side, -side, whenever that may be, because this thing is, it does way more than I could have ever hoped that it would do, especially now, <laughs> the way it's built. But if I ever get a new one, that's the one thing that's going to help identify which machine I end up with is two things. Is there a dirt clutch available? Are there portals available? Because I'm not doing without either one. That's just my riding style. These, these two things together could not be more beneficial, more perfect for what I like to do. The dirt clutch basically gives you what seems like a two-speed automatic transmission with a granny low first gear. The dura clutch keeps your belt at the bottom of the primary under full tension at all times. Even when it's sitting here right now, that belt is under full tension. But when you're in when you're in motion, that tension translates to never burning a belt. The job of pulling off from idle and turning the drivetrain is put into a new centrifugal clutch that's built in to the main primary clutch. And that gives you smooth starts and ultra low engagement. This engagement happens at about 200 RPM above idle. I can literally crawl with full force um, at less than a normal walking speed with that dura clutch in, in these portals. The other added benefit to that is it keeps your belt low in the primary so you get a lot more torque uh, through your drivetrain up until about four or five thousand RPM and then the belt the sheaves begin to squeeze the belt it rides up so you don't actually lose any of your speed by using the dura clutch when you rev that motor up you're still going to get the same amount of belt transfer from one side to the other it's just going to happen much later in the RPM range um, and when that happens you notice it because you actually feel the vehicle suddenly begin speeding up just like it shifted in the second out of first gear. It's, it's really cool. But like I said, I, I will never have another side-by-side -side without a dirt clutch portal combo, period. It's just my preference. I think that wraps up the outside. Um, there's a little rear view camera up there from my ride command system, and there's a front view camera up there in the grill as well. That actually came on the machine, but that camera was mounted um, way low down here. And it was, it was made in order to be able to see the rear trailer hitch, but I wanted to use it as a rear view camera. So I bought an extension cable and mounted it way up there. Now it works really good for a rear view camera. And I can see it right there on my screen. So what I'm gonna do now is hop inside and we'll go over what I've done in here and that'll just about wrap us up. I'm going to start right here, though, before I get in with the seats. These are PRP seats, the GT3 is one of their top-of-the-line seats, designed them myself on their uh, online tool. It has a nice orange accent, which is this vehicle's uh, accent color anyway, when it had stickers on it and orange factory springs. But I got PRP uh, four-point harnesses. The shoulder belts are sewn into the lap belts, which makes uh, putting them on very, very easy. And they also have an automotive style latch. So putting these things off and on is really just about as quick as a shoulder belt without the negative aspect of having that, that shoulder belt ratchet that always fails when it gets grit and grime inside of it and never works right again. But these seats are very comfortable and they also have seat warmers in them in the, the back and the bottom. So we call them the, the butt warmers. Your butt warmers work really good in these things. As a matter of fact, It'll run you out of here after about 10 minutes and you got to turn it off and <laughs> let your butt cool down. <laughs> All right, let's crawl inside of it and I'll show you some more stuff. Uh, crawling inside of it is a bit of a uh, trick on its own, but anyway, I made it. 
Let me put these around my shoulders because I don't like them poking me in the back. Okay, now that we're in here, the uh, first thing I'll talk about is these grab handles. I got these off of Etsy. I don't know for sure, this is just a guess, but I think Justin Pierpoint's wife maybe, or a family member uh, are making these and sell them on Etsy. They're made out of paracord. They have these adorable, tiny, tiny little D-rings on them. And it's hooked to the roll bar that goes across the top of the windshield up here. And like I said, um, her last name was Pierpoint and it came from Tennessee, which is where they're based. So that's why I'm thinking that it was, it was probably her that made them and is selling them. But extremely, extremely useful for getting in and out of this machine. Um, we'll go up from there. The headliner is a Polaris headliner uh, for the general. Um, I don't know what this is. It's, I guess it's kind of like boat carpet or something, but it's very durable. I have pressure washed it and sprayed it, and it looks just as new and nice as it did the day I got it, and it's over two years old now. This is a Polaris dome light. You can touch it and turn it on and then press it and hold it to turn it off. You can also unclick the little thing and carry it around with you and use it as a flashlight at night. It's pretty neat. And then you just get it turned to the right spot and you can just twist it, lock it back in place, press it and hold, turn it off. Really neat. I put a little level gauge in here. I haven't actually used this. I just put it in, but I do want to see, I'm actually gonna take this machine out and tie it to a tree and then use my one of my tractors to pull it over sideways and see about where it begins to tip and then let the, the rope tied to the tree catch it or the winch maybe, I don't know. But anyway, I wanna see if it goes up to this 45 or goes past it or maybe not quite to it. I wanna see where it tips. And then when I'm on the trails and I'm getting kinda of sketchy, I can look and say, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty, pretty close. I mean, you, I know you can do it by feel, but I, and I've had this thing over on the side a couple of times, but I really couldn't tell you exactly where it's going to go over, and I, I want to know that. So that's what that's for. Here's my flip-up windshield latch. You can unlatch it and flip that joker up. I love this windshield. It's expensive, but it's awesome because it's there when you need it, and it's not when you don't need it. You don't have to take it off and go store it somewhere, go hide it behind a tree, come back later on in the day and find it's gone. You just flip it up out of the way, and it's like it's not there. And then if you need it, if it starts raining, if it's super cold, you just close it up. Or if you're blasting down the road and you don't want the bugs coming in, close it up. And then you can latch it partway open. It came with a latch to do that, but if it's raining or really cold, that can be a little too much. So I ended up actually adding a third stop for it right here to latch it here and only have it open that much. Now, when it's raining, you can still get some air, but the water doesn't come in. And uh, if it's really cold, you get just enough breeze to keep the inside fresh and crisp without freezing. All right, so the next thing we'll talk about, steering wheel. I got a nice little Assault D-style uh, steering wheel here. It's got steering wheel here. And it's got a uh, suede that's actually beginning to get worn down. This steering wheel is over two years old as well. I actually originally bought this steering wheel to put on my blue 904. And I even had blue screws and accents, but uh, the steering wheel came in the day after that thing caught fire. It was awful. I was like, oh my God, you gotta be kidding me. But anyway, I actually uh, contacted them and, and talked about sending it back, but they said, well, how about, you know, your new vehicle? You're, you're gonna get one, right? And I'm like, sure I am. And I was like, I guess it's, you know, and at the time I didn't know what I was getting, but later on down the road, uh, I called them back and I said, hey, you know, I'm the one with the burn up razor and the steering wheel that I can't use. and I need orange, so uh, they sent me orange screw kit and accent kit, and here it is, so. But I like it, it feels really nice. It feels much nicer than the factory one. Uh, let me hit the key and light it up for you so you can see everything going on in here. There's my uh, little blinker handle, kind of like, just like on a vehicle. This is my indicator light to show that the blinkers are actually on, so. It's, it's like this so that you'll see, oh yeah, my blinker's on, let me turn that off. It even has a hazard function if you pull out on it. Um, that's really neat. And normal switches here. Here's my belt temperature gauge. I forgot to mention that when I was outside. This is from uh, Warthog. It is a belt temperature gauge. It will alert you when your belt is getting too warm or just simply just getting hot and you're damaging it. 
And in order to help mitigate that, I have an inline blower on the belt exhaust. It's called a blowhole, and they sell them on Duraclutch's website. Um, you can get them from other places too, but I just happened to get mine from Duraclutch since I was there shopping. And you can turn it off, and right now I have fresh air cycling through the belt housing, being pulled in from both fresh air intakes and blowing through the, the clutch housing and out the exhaust. So this is great for helping keep your, your belt cooler. With it running, I would say the belt runs uh, an average of 15 to 20 degrees cooler while in use with that fan on than it would without it. So that's, I, I put it on the switch, but honestly, I didn't need to. If I was to do this again, I wouldn't have put that on a switch. I would just have it come on when the key is on like it does from the fact, like from the manufacturers. That's the way they designed it, but I switched it for no reason whatsoever, it turns out. I thought when I was in cold weather, I would leave it off until the belt got warm, but it doesn't take it very long to get warm, so that turned out to not really be needed. Another thing I shouldn't have bothered with is putting a switch on my wireless phone charger. Um, I should have just had it cut on with the ignition and stay on, but this is a Ram Tough Mount uh, X-Grip wireless phone charger. I dropped my cell phone in here. I run my lifetime uh, trail maps, and the, it keeps it charged all day, even while it's hunting for signal and uh, running my trail maps, and the screen stays on all day, and then I don't lose battery. Again, didn't really need to switch. I have it for driver and passenger side. And let's see, what else do we have up here? Um, my Sasquatch light switch for turning on the light bars. And then this is the one for the uh, axe and winch up front. And these are my seat heaters here. And then my windshield wiper. And then it's sprayer. <laughs> Sounds cute. Sounds kind of wimpy, but it's held up good. It's, again, a lot of the stuff on this machine is over two years old now, and I haven't had any problems out of any of it. Uh, my rock light switch, turn them on, but of course it's the middle of the day, so I can't really see them too much. You can see the light itself, but not what they're illuminating. And then I can turn my radios on. I could have just, you know, reached down and just turned the radios on like normal, the radio and the intercom, but I wanted to leave them set where I, I would like to have them and then just flip them on like that. So that's the reason they're on a switch. And right here at the end of the video, and the thing gets hot and cuts off again. Anyway, okay, what I was saying, this is a rugged radio, GMR 25-watt uh, radio. Um, I can use the uh, GMR as channels. And then this is a rugged intercom that allows me to have four-seat communication in car, and then front-seat communication with car-to-car um, -car communications like most people use these days but anyway and this is my push to talk buttons that i put right here in the dash make them easy to use easy to get to instead of having the velcro strap on switches like like what comes with it and then i got these nice little headsets that look like the old style like sony walkman headsets but it's behind the head and it has a microphone with it so you don't have to use those in helmet kits anymore because we use those uh axle off-road helmets that are open around your ears and your face um, and I especially use it for recording but those uh, those fit really well they're there they let it you know your head have access to breeze and, and <laughs> cool temperatures and whatnot but anyway and then we can wear our little headsets with them as well and plug them into these jacks down here and like I said I got them in all four seats now so we have uh, complete in-car communication if we want it and then I think just about the last thing to show you in here is this gear grabber shifter. Um, this is awesome for rock crawling or just trail reuse in general because it will only let you switch between low and reverse. It won't go any further than that in any dire either direction without squeezing this handle. So you're riding the trail, you're in low and you pull up to something and you want to back up real quick, you just do that and you don't have to hunt for that gear by doing this and making sure you, it pops in just correctly. It just stops right where it's supposed to. Uh, and this can also save you if you're about to go over, you can quickly switch directions and get on the gas and maybe turn the wheel in the opposite direction from your roll and set the buggy back down. I've actually done that a few times now since I put this in here. 
Then if you want to go into park, all you do is just squeeze the handle and push, and then you go into park, or you pull it all the way back, squeeze it, pull it back again, and now you're in high. Um, just nice little feature. If you, if you ride trails at all, I would recommend something like this, this brand or a brand like it. There's quite a few out there. Some of them are more complicated than others. This is nice and simple. It's well made and it works good. So that just about wraps everything up. I think I've shown you just about everything I've done to it. Um, ooh, got one. <laughs> Uh, one thing I want to mention is I still have my uh, turf mode uh, in this general. You know, your generals and your, your rangers come with a turf mode and, and they a lot of people delete them. They, they do a turf mode delete, but as long as you treat it right, there's no reason to delete it. I love my turf mode, especially out there riding on the roads. I have an open rear diff that uh, is fully functional and when I get out there and start wheeling for real, I just turn it off and let it engage without being under stress of any kind, and then it works perfectly. I haven't had any trouble with it after more than two years of hard wheeling. So, but yeah, that's, uh, that's about it. That's gonna wrap this up, and I wanna thank you for watching, especially if you made it this far <laughs> through the video. I know this is a long one, but you know how I like to make long videos, and you, you know I like to talk, and um, so again, thanks for sticking with me on this, and Please, if you don't mind, give that little like button a good smushing and show it you care. And then, uh, you know, if you haven't subscribed to the channel, if you enjoy this content, you might consider that. It's free. You know, just push the button and then you'll get notifications when I do new videos and stuff. Uh, also, I'm trying to stick to a schedule of uploading um, ride videos on Sunday at noon Eastern Time. Shop videos will go up just whenever I make them. I don't know when that will be. Um, but once again, thanks for watching. I really appreciate you guys. Uh, I appreciate you sticking with me for all this time. This channel is now seven years old, if I'm not mistaken. And hopefully it will continue many, many more. So I will catch you in the next one. Take care.